Hi, I'm Janet Deneef, founder and director of the Ubud Writers and Readers Festival. You are about to hear one of our highlight conversations recorded live for our 2022 festival, which explored the role of the written word in upholding humanity's values and freedoms through our festival theme, Mamayu Hayuning Bawana, Uniting Humanity. So please settle in and let the magic of our 19th festival continue. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. Welcome to this very, very important, kind of controversial panel, <laughs> Two Sides of the Wellness Industry. So the wellness industry helps all of us, and those of us who live here in Bali are definitely benefiting from being here in this industry, but how well is the wellness industry? That's what we're here to discuss. There are some problematic aspects of the wellness industry and a quick visit to Alchemy and the community board can give you a sense if you live out here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and what we're here to ask is what's the middle path? What's the way forward? Very, very tough questions, and that's why I am really glad that I'm not answering any of these questions, but I'm going to ask these incredible women uh, for their opinion. So let me start by introducing our panelists. We have Fariha Roshin. If you're in this room because this issue is interesting, I would say you need to get her book. There is, she wrote a book that was released two or three months ago, and it's called Who is Wellness For? And it's a critical analysis, a deep, heart-wrenching read. It's tough. It's a tough read, but it's a beautiful read. And it's, yeah, so we're going to get some really cool industry insights from her. Um, the next person, for those of us who live in Bali, needs no introduction. Bandana Tewari is an advocate of sustainability in the world of fashion and beyond. Bandana left her fabulous life in Mumbai where she worked <coughs> as uh, editor at Vogue India for 13 years. And she joined all of us seeking Om Shanti 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 here in Bali. She's been living here for five years. So some interesting insights about the wellness industry here in Bali. And finally, Huda, Huda Fadel Mula. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Huda is uh, Australian, she's a champion of, let me, let me get them right. The whole Aus title. Australian's Poetry Slam champion. Wow. Yeah. Ooh. And her words are fire and they cut straight to your heart. She's performing at the <clears throat> festival, so definitely go to see her. Bring some tissues, because it's going to get you. And finally, all of you are our fourth member of this conversation. And we want to keep this conversation super dynamic. I'm going to be asking for questions, so get your questions ready. Um, in about 10 or 15 minutes, I'm going to be asking for questions. And let's start it off with a few, um, a few, a little, a little poll, all right? So can everybody make the sound, whoo, whoo, okay. So by way of whoo, how many people think they know truly what the word decolonizing wellness means? Okay, a one woo? <coughs> okay. Um, how many people feel like the wellness industry does more harm than good? Okay, okay, a little woo. <laughs> Um, how many people here practice yoga in a shala or in a group setting? <laughs> okay, okay, some woos. I gotta get on my yoga. <laughs> and of those people who practice in group settings, how many feel a little uneasy about cultural appropriation? Or <laughs> okay, okay. And just for my information, how many people live in Bali or come visit? Fairly often. 
All right. Okay. So a lot of people. Let's let's get started. And ladies and gentlemen, can we give a round of applause to our panelists before we start? So Fariha, let's start with you. Incredible book. Very very complex ideas. Can you give us the three-minute version of your core arguments? Oh my God! Yeah, I'll I'll try. Um, so I published a book called "Who Is Wellness For." It came out on in, on June fourteenth, um, and it's something that I've been thinking this question: "Who is wellness for?" I've been thinking about it for a long time. I started writing about self-care and wellness about seven years ago, and. It started as an inquiry of myself. I, I was just curious as to how does someone with a lot of trauma start to engage in healing. Um, and the more I thought about it, the more the holes were very blatant. And it's something that I feel I knew um, in the fabric of my being and body for a really long time, um, witnessing as a child, uh, yoga, um, yoga centers, and, and mainly white people existing in those spaces with absolutely no consideration or context about what yoga is and where it comes from. Um, that was something as a child that I acknowledged. And as an adult, I think what happens or what's so insidious about white supremacy is that it, it comes into every aspect of being. And I didn't, I, I think what is very important for me is that I learned to accept that the world was just not made for me. Mm. And that my culture was for other people and it wasn't necessarily mine. And um, that then I think kind of fermented and became something bigger and that's the genesis of the book it's sort of this like ongoing question with self and trying to really understand how is this fair like that let's just start there what does fairness look like how does how do we engage um, like gracefully and 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 fairly cons considerately more with each other i think that's really the sort of basis of the book. It's, it's about many different things, but it's really about the holistic question of what do we owe one another? Yeah. Yeah. Great. It's such an incredible <coughs> book, and I think we're going to get into many of the themes as we continue. Bandana, let's move on to you, and can you tell us, from your perspective, from what the work you've been doing in the fashion world, where is the link between wellness and fashion, and also Where's the links between the toxic trends in the fashion world and the same kind of trends you're seeing in the wellness world? Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, 13 years of working in Vogue, trust me, I had no idea about sustainability. That wasn't even a term that we used in our daily fashion parlance. But of course, this is before COVID and you know, my own interest, again, your personal search when you're living in what I call filthy wealth and the sort of the privileges of fashion is very classist and um, the socioeconomic structure privileges the ones with money. And so uh, when I pivoted towards a sustainable fashion, it became very apparent, here we are, me, I'm a media person, I'm a writer, I'm a journalist, and we keep talking about clothes being so important to sort of accessing your identity. Mm. We call it our second skin. Yet, what we put on our bodies is so distanced mm. from, let's say, what we put into our body. We live in Bali. Everyone is on some sort of diet, a juice diet, some kind of, you know, I talked about this in my TEDx talk, that, you know, we are constantly going on a cleanse, to cleanse our system, to cleanse our insides. Yet we forget that what we put on our body, because we're certainly not walking our, around naked, we are putting something on our second skin, and we undermine the value, the importance, the gravity of what we put on our body. So my, um, sort of my appeal at that time, at that speech was, um, go on a fashion diet, 
buy less. Because if we are saying, I want to consume less carbohydrates to cleanse my body, then I should be buying less polyester to cleanse my skin. I, I couldn't see the difference in the way my inner self and my outer self should be seen differently. But of course, that come, came with a lot of challenges because we are so disconnected with the way fashion is presented to us, what we wear on our bodies. I mean, all of us are carrying leather bags. And I don't blame any one of you. I'm not pointing a finger. I have tons of leather bags myself. But that leather comes off the body of an animal that has been treated over and over again so it can look swelt, shiny, mm -hmm. has the sheen, the softness, the suppleness. We forget it is the skin of an animal. It's a carcass. You know, sitting at Paris Fashion Week, I'm sorry, I'm going to make this very no, no, quick. No, no. Sitting in Paris Fashion Week and we're seeing furs parading, you know, in the Dior's and the Gucci sh shows. And I've sat there for 13 years, trust me, not feeling an iota of conscience. But if today you really <laughs> think about it, for every animal that actually walks down the ramp, for every animal that we carry, if we were to prop it up in front of us, you know, there would be a sea of animals sitting in front of us. And that is the disconnection of fashion and wellness. This is where producti production of fashion and the consumption of fashion is so dislocated mm -hmm. because we've never been told anything better as consumers. I'm not blaming any one of us. What did I know about the production of leather and the mutilation of alligators for an Hermes bag? I, what did I know? I did not know. So the onus for me personally and my journey as yours with your book um, was that let's get down, let's draw the curtains to the making of what's behind the curtains of fashion and consumption. And therefore, uh, coming to Bali, it was very easy for me to say goodbye to Vogue and then embark on this journey uh, of sustainable fashion. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Bandana. And something I didn't mention about Huda is she's um, a trained nurse. She's currently writing a book on mental health and <laughs> is potentially on the path of becoming a doctor. Wow. So, yeah, overachievers, all of them <laughs> overachievers. You want to get um, some self esteem issues be on this <laughs> panel. Stop it. <laughs> so, Huda, you are a black Muslim woman. Mm -hmm. When a lot you of problems. Yeah. <laughs> so when you try to access healing, what are the issues you face from the professionals that are sitting across from you? You can tell us from a personal perspective and also from a professional perspective. Uh, there are so many multiple tangents I can go on. Um, after I graduated school, I was like, I did the bio thing and my mom was like, go be a doctor, you're smart enough to do it. So I did my nursing degree. And one of my placements was at a mental health hospital for like three weeks. And um, I had these like really interesting conversations about research and the importance of uh, promoting wellness and what that looks like intrinsically. And then I was in these spaces seeing the complete contradicting of everything I had studied in these systems, hmm. right? Then I started to have a conversation with myself as I had a, a patient slash client who was a person of color and um, who was an alcoholic. And we had a conversation. I said, you know, like you're in this hospital, you've been here for a long time. How have you been mentally? What's the process? And one of the first things that came up for her was her connection to family and culture and how her distance and being in a room with no one that looked like her affected her ability to heal, mm. which brought up an interesting conversation about when we talk about the industry of wellness, who makes up the ecosystem in the chamber and how are they in charge of supporting people that look like me? For example, I got diagnosed with anxiety at 15 years old due to PTSD of, PTSD of living in uh, war toads on countries. I have ADHD right now and can I get diagnosed because I'm a black woman. So the process is taking me much, much longer to get diagnosed where a doctor literally looked at me and said, I'm going to be honest with you, as a black woman, getting diagnosed with ADHD is very hard um, because the symptoms are very different and you have to find a clinician that specializes in ADHD and working with women of color for you to be able to get the diagnosis. Mind you, I'm writing a master's. With that, with that, that ADHD diagnosis, writing a master's is gonna feel like you're trying to get a three-year-old to sit down for 17 hours. It is torture, absolutely miserable 
Like everyone's like, oh my God, you're writing a book. It's really cool. I'm like, I'm so bored. My brain cannot handle it. It cannot at all. Um, when I talk about the intricacy of my journey and then being a poet, um, I find that I'm in spaces where I'm the only black person in the room every time. And it sounds great, like all oh, representation is being ticked off. At least you're there, right? It's great. But that means I have to bear my trauma as an entertainment value for a bunch of strangers and then advocate for the presence of other people to follow after me. That's a lot of work, a lot of mental health work. No one is prepared for the presence of people who will actually need the wellness preparation mm. to step in the room. And no one has ever prepped for me, not as a poet, not as an educator, mm. not as a researcher. Um, I have to be the voice, the tool, the divisiveness to everything to in ensure any progress moves forward. So the complexity of me being a black woman and a Muslim woman and then a woman on top of that is everywhere I am. I have to go out of my way to find a physician who understands my intricacies. At 17 years old, one of the counselors was like, you should just move out of home. I was like, oh, you mean my black ass household? <laughs> you mean like losing culture, religion, connection to land, to people? What would I get to repair that? Yeah. Your answers that you have in this textbook were never made for me. Mm. You don't know how to include me in the conversation. Mm. So my job has been include me in the conversation mm. so we can at least have something that reflects people who look like me. Mm. So my struggle is continuous and getting people to stop making it my labor to do better. Mm. I don't have the funds. <laughs> you can. You can absolutely fund research to talk about why less people of color or black people in Australia are not accessing mental health support. You can absolutely do that. I can't. All I can do is get up on stage and do a poem about it and hope somebody gives a damn. Mm. That's the most I can do. Mm. So there's a, there's a lot to unpack, but I won't be long-winded. Maybe questions will navigate my answer better. So, mm. Mm. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow, 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 wow. Uh, so, Fariha, what are your thoughts about what Huda just said? Um, I'm having a hard time with this microphone. Is that good? Is that too hard? Okay. <clears throat> Well, I agree with everything that Huda said. Um, a lot of it is what I wrote about in my book, uh, the, the, the sad realities of who gets access to wellness and who gets access to be well. I think that's, that's really why I asked that question. Um, thank you. Uh, you know, I mean, because it's glaring. And, and also, like, there's so many layers, class, race, um, you know, those are the, the really big ones. Like, how do you afford to take care of yourself when you can't literally afford to? Um, you know, and generational trauma, genocide. My family survived genocide, not, not my ancestors, my parents. Mm. What does that do to your body? Um, I think those are questions that I'm constantly asking, and it's unfortunate that we are than the ones that are forced to do the work and the labor to educate people and to humanize ourselves and to humanize and explain uh, the travesty of what's happening. I mean, even you know everything that you were saying as well, sort of the intentionality that is lacking, the, 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 the desperate lack of consideration that exists is, um, is really, really, really um, upsetting to me on a, on a deep soul level. And so I think that all we can do is continue to have these conversations to shift what is actually happening. And I think the way to do that is for, for people to actually invest in redistribution of wealth um, and actually consider like what does it mean to um, not hoard capital and not hoard money and to uh, generate, um, it's not about like even you can't practice yoga because it's not from your culture. It's how do you encourage and allow other people and, and more access to yoga? You know, not everybody can afford a $150. Um, I live in Los Angeles. Not everybody can afford a very expensive, you know, yoga pass. What does it mean when a, a person whose lineage, ancestral lineage comes from, from that source, but they can't themselves practice yoga like that is a that is a very sad reality um so i think that 
conversations are important, but I'm beyond the conversation. I want action now. So like that's who is wellness for is really about, okay, let's just acknowledge all of this and then let's move forward and think about actionable ways to change this industry and to change capitalism, the very nefarious realities of capitalism. Yeah, capitalism let's stay with that because... Spirituality. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if, if we go back to decolonization, right? That one makes a lot of people pretty nervous. And I get that you're saying you're beyond that and you want action. But in your book, you say one of the testaments of wellness is an ability to sit with a wound, mm. to be fully mm. present and to see mm. the ills. But so many of us in the wellness industry are like, well, I don't want to think about colonization and all of like, this is really like, it's so traumatizing to read some of like mm. my own history. Mm. And I'm sure a lot of people feel the same way in this room. I want to focus on getting well. Mm. So this conflict is, kind of can lead to um, a singular thinking, spiritual bypassing. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for people who are feeling that tension? I think uh, truth is liberation. I think thinking about how has society come here? Why are we at this point? Everything has happened because of colonization. We're in the age of Anthropocene because of colonization. You know, like the uh, the first action, I say this in the book, but like the first action was really uh, this this movement of, of, of enslaving people from Africa and bringing them to America. That, that, that was the beginning of the Anthropocene. And I think I think about that lo a lot spiritually and what that means to genocide people, to take people from their land and to enslave them and what that does to you as a person. That we haven't even thought about on a global level and we are all impacted by that. And I think there's a desire to move beyond it and a desire to not look at it because it's the wound, because it's so uncomfortable. But I do feel like actually going to it and not only naming it, but having conversations like this that are deeply uncomfortable where people have to face themselves it gets easier. It really does. That, that process, it doesn't feel like it does, but the, the more you name it, the more you sit with it, the more you face yourself, and the more I think you are accountable to your own actions, the more you encourage transparency in yourself and others, it does have an impact. And I think that that, to me, is really encouraging and exciting. To do that work is really exciting to me. Mm. So on that, let's talk about living in Bali as a non-Balinese person. And I don't know about y'all, but I definitely have some conflicting opinions about replicating some of these old systems of colonialism and extraction. Right. All in the pursuit of our wellness. Okay, so Bandana, here's a question for you. After five years of living here, what are your thoughts on this and how do people navigate this pretty difficult situation? This is a difficult one because, you know, no matter which way you slice it, I feel I, I don't want to sound like the person who's said, standing on a pedestal, pointing a finger and saying, what are you doing is not right. I'm in no position to say that because everyone's doing their practices in the way they have to do it. People are learning in the way they want to learn. I come from an incredibly rich history of Vedic thought, Vedanta, which is the genesis of yoga, of Ayurveda. Um, and it is so old, it's so rich, it's pre-Hindu, it is wisdom that's passed down uh, by word of mouth and only maybe 7,000 years, 5,000 years ago is when it was uh, written down as uh, the Vedas, the Upanishads, and that's where the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, which is the Bible of yoga. I'm not saying I'm <laughs> learned in all those fields. I'm a student of Vedanta. I spend a lot of time trying to actually unpack what it means to have grown up in, in that culture, coming to Bali, which has a similar culture, and then having the whole world here, which also wants to participate. So where do I stand? What is my authentic self? 
It's, it's a complete navigation, and I, can, I do not have the right answer. What I can tell you personally is the level of discomfort I feel when I go like this to a yoga class. Because I've grown up seeing my grandmother wear a six-yard sari and do a headstand in six yards of sari, and she's got a beautiful pot belly that seems to have all the luscious kindness and compassion of love, you know, where you're not judged because you're not fit enough. You're not judged because you're not doing your asanas in the perfect mode for the perfect time. And I go with my jingle jangle, and this is whole of Indonesia in my arm, and I feel so proud of it. And, you know, I'm reminded, like, take off everything because it will, you know, obstruct your asana. And so I find that extremely tiring because mm -hmm. yoga is not about uh, fitness. Yeah. Yoga is not. I know that intrinsically, not in a pedantic way for myself, because that's what the first line of Yoga Sutras, Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, the purpose of yoga, the first line is the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind. Mm. So the reason why you do yoga is to just achieve some level of stillness, that you go out of your head, out of your mind, out of your thoughts, out of your anxiety, and find that cosmic stillness, the micro and the micro, macro. So when I go to a class with that sense, and I'm reminded again and again that I don't look fit, I'm wobbly, and I'm not in the gear, I'm not wearing polyester made out of petroleum because I want my clothes to breathe while doing mindful yoga. In my mind, it seems, so I, it was too much to nav navigate, so I stopped doing those classes. I mean, I have my little practice on my own. I'm no good, but I do spend half an hour, one hour on my own in my little garden. But I just don't have the, the gumption to go into a wonderful class and sit all the, with all these fabulous people, with all these beautiful bodies, with the beautiful asanas, and they're all doing the things I can never do. And I hate myself because I'm sitting there feeling sad, jealous, envious, all the things that I'm going to yoga to get rid of. <laughs> and I'm perched right there in the middle of that anxiety. So I'm not saying I have the answer, but in my own life, I realize just retracting and practicing on my own, in my own little foolish way, and finding my own calm space, that works for me. Yeah. And so to, to, your, you, to your question, what does this, does this mean? To each their own, but to me, I can't survive it. I can't survive this by being in a big class. Mm. Right, yeah. There's an element of performative acrobatics mm. in this white dominated yoga scene that, you know, we were speaking of like practicing in India, it's not like that. And I felt the same thing when I came here to Bali, so I can I hear you on that. But I wanted to ask you, like, the question was, how do you navigate your, so you are an expatriate here, you know, in, here in Bali, and there are some kind of problematic aspects about colonialism and the colonial past of coming in. What do you feel is well, your I responsibility <laughs> as someone who lives here to the local culture? Sort of historical, if you want to call it, historical, colonization, well, let me rephrase that, the narrative colonization, because, you know, Hinduism, uh, yoga practice, meditation practices, whatever, it's packed with wisdom from the heritage that comes from the Indian subcontinent, and it's layered, and it requires years and years of, you know, sort of living through it, and like an onion, peeling layers and layers, and it's a li lifelong quest. I know what it takes to understand just the absolute significance, the, the, the potentiality of the word Om, not just as a tattoo, not just as a chant, but the entire poten potentiality of a vibration that resonates from there and here, and it's extremely profound. And it takes, it's a, a, a lifelong quest. It cannot be a reductionist idea of three sentences to explain, a tattoo to attach yourself to it. It's a commitment to understand these, these profound words that, uh, that, tran that transcend religion. Mm -hmm. 
today quantum mechanics talks <laughs> in the same uh, spiritual ways that you know old Vedantic th thought does. Mm -hmm. So for me, that the, the robbing of the, the the reductionism of that language of wisdom that I find a little sad because. I'm so eager as a student to learn more and more and deep dive in. The world keeps unfurling like a lotus, you know. It's just, there's so much more to know, so much more to know. And then to think that someone can sit in front of you and then blurt it out in three sentences and think they got it, that it, it sort of undermines other people's journeys. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Vandana. And Huda, before we go around and ask questions, so get your questions ready. Is it possible to decolonize wellness in our lifetime? Oh, I wish. Um, there is so much layer and complexity and avenues to start with, right? When you talk about decolonization, there's a work of in internalized racism that the person, I as a black person, individually have to do, right? Which is to sit with the womb, right? To address the womb to figure out a plan in a world that does not recognize or have places for you to heal with the right skill set that acknowledge culture, tradition, language, the intrinsic depth of the wound, mm. right? So it's one thing to look at yourself and acknowledge the deep, profound, extended scars of this world and its history inflicted on people on me. That's one set of work, right? Then to be in an ecosystem, an immediate ecosystem, which is family, you are also doing the same work and not rotating and recreating generational trauma. Mm. That's a whole nother set of work, right? Then you got to then require people that have an individualistic ability to go, how am I a part of a world that is better and equal or of equity or sustainability or humility to others? which is a question we don't ask ourselves enough. Compassion to me is a skill we all need to work on, mm. right? If we do that first, everything else starts to unravel itself. And most people do not have the ability to sit with the wound because you cannot clean what you do not see. Mm. You cannot stitch what you are not looking at, right? You cannot plan for tomorrow without the observational this. Mm. You can't back into a space without knowing what's behind you. And there is a denial about the int how deep this history we're talking about is. Because everybody likes to backburn it. It's all, it happened. No, yeah. no, no. It's happening. Mm. Yeah. It's not a past tense thing. So de to decolonize is to ask these so-called allies what deep, intrinsic, environmental, spiritual, compassionate, social things are you doing to ensure that you are an ally to me while I do my own work of being sure. present with you. Right? And most people can't even look at my scar, let alone acknowledge that your ignorance or ignoring it means I continue to be cut. Mm. Mm. Like, you choosing not to want to be uncomfortable is at the expense of my life. Mm. It's, it's discomfort, but it's my life. Mm. So these moments of panels and conversations is survival. It's breath for somebody else. It is somebody on the break of depression, coded by systematic racism, patriarchal societies, and an abnormal thing of chucking black bodies to the side and only smelling them when they're dead, right? That's real. So this discomfort that you're dodging, is you willing to put me on a sideline? So to decolonize is an evaluation of every fragment and molecule that we have present in our ecosystem, and you choosing to wake the fuck up, excuse my language, right? To choose to wake up because I can't be the sirens every time that land on deaf ears we can't keep having the same conversation and you don't choose to be the tool right mm -hmm. and what that means is when you ask I live in First Nations land in Australia right so my sheer presence is a contribution to the colonial effect of that land my job is to tread very carefully on that land yeah. and to acknowledge that my book was written on Turbu Yagra land Wherever I take you with me around the world, my pitch, my conversation will start with an acknowledgement of the people in which lands I wrote my book on. That is the least I can do as a servitude to knowing that I probably get served before you do. Mm. Because it celebrates this messed up ecosystem. So to decolonize is how many people go home in the mirror and figure out how can I be better 
And how can I evaluate the privilege that I continue to have as a person who is not black to ensure that the next black person has better? Can it happen in my lifetime? Hell no. But it can happen on a micro level to ensure mm -hmm. that maybe the next generation of people have better. All I'm asking for is just do better. Mm -hmm. I'm not asking you to fix it, just do better. That's it. Mm. Mm. I think. <laughs> oh. All right. Wow. So I'm sure there's some level of discomfort in this room <laughs> right now and probably a lot of questions. Um, if you have some questions, I would like to take maybe a couple of them and then we could get to answering them. Yeah. But it's so not it's just Africa. In uh, India... No, no, no. Sorry. Yeah. Hold so on a second. Sorry. I'm going to just take a few questions and then we'll, we'll answer it. So it's a question on colorism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? It's a question. I think it's more of a statement. Um, I'm actually quite surprised that we went racial <laughs> and we stayed racial. Um, because the things that I see in wellness industry are deeper and broader than that. I hear a lot of anger and pain and actually I've learned a lot from you ladies sharing. But I wonder if we are aware that these problems, some of the problems that have been described, they happen also among white population. For example, misdiagnosis. 85% of bipolar people in treatment have been misdiagnosed. It takes 13.2 years for a bipolar person to get appropriate treatment, according to recent UK study. And these are mostly white surveys. So, my point is that it's not just racial. This miseducation, misinformation, the wellness industry. The question in the beginning was, how well is the wellness industry? I think the answer is in the question. No, industry cannot be well. As soon as it becomes organized, there is spirituality, there is religion. Same, same. Beautiful spirituality and then dogmatic, organized religion. So I think what we... I just wonder if we can look deeper and broader and not let eloquence and anger and pain that's coming out these days for the first time blind us to the scope of the rest of the issue. Okay, thank you. Anastasia, for your comment. Anastasia is a psychologist, right? And so I understand where that question and comment is coming from and we'll definitely get a comment from the panel. Any other questions or comments? Yep. Thanks. Uh, from my point of view, when we talk about wellness, it's like spiritual journey. And not, like you said, like, uh, maybe not, of all, all, not all of the people in the world have privilege to experience the spiritual journey. Because we, our world is shaped to capitalism and when we took a broader view, like, okay, for me, like, I have constant battle for my, my own value and, uh, and how we facing the world. And like you said, uh, what we wear inside and what we wear outside is like constant battle. So I think it is from our earlier age we should know that uh, something like value like this, we must learn from education at the school. But I think our education system not teach us about this, how we facing our trauma, how we facing mm. our uh, value, how we face the different world, like how you feel, how you, how I, I, I want to know how you feel it. Thank you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, any other questions and comments? 
Okay, so let's, uh, yeah, okay, all right, let's go. Are you ready? <laughs> so we have a few comments, and I'm going to throw it open to all y'all to see how you want to discuss it. Um, and let's start with the, the comment around can we move beyond the racial question, right? That's it, that there's more to this conversation than just um, a racial decolonizing lens. What is your response to it? Either. I, I, I absolutely agree. I think that, to, sure, we can move beyond it, but you have to start with naming it. You actually have to start where it, it we haven't globally talked about this. It's a very new conversation. And so I think that I, I get the frustrations of, of wanting it to be a, a more expansive conversation, but we haven't even had the conversation that we need to have. And that is about the fact that the reason why we practice wellness globally is because it was extracted from cultures that are not white to essentially feed and heal white people. I also have um, just an inquiry about this study that was done mainly on white people. I wonder if other people were included in the study or if it was just specifically about white people because that's also the issue, right? It's that fact that people of color are not considered in these, in these conversations in the first place enough for us to even mm. be acknowledged. So yeah. Um, it's it's a big it's a big thing to talk about, but I if we go back to the metaphor of addressing the wound, we have to address the wound first. Yeah, that's why we're here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Would you like to add to that? I I absolutely see the need for the conversation, and as a someone who is a healthcare practitioner who I've been navigating as a nurse, and write, I'm writing my research on the lack of cultural competency and health practices meaning this shared conversation is what needs to be had, right? So when, when I'm sitting on a panel with three, two other beautiful women of color, moderated by another woman of color, that's the conversation that has to have. Right. Because when we talk about the statistics and the numbers, a lot of those statistics are written from white bodies. So we're not even making it to the hospital to be misdiagnosed. We're not even getting that far along in the conversation. So we can absolutely investigate the fact that, to me, the wellness industry has a lot of um, marketable things that they just throw out there. As a, I'm a proud black woman, I wear waist beads, and it became trendy for people to put them on as a way of celebrating femininity, when for me, there were a cultural practice that I had to go through rigorous processes, right? Where people now are wearing my culture as costume. So to talk about the wellness industry and to study the dynamics of misdiagnosis, the lack of understanding how gender shows up and patriarchy shows Class. up in mental health, all of these things are extremely vital conversations. And I hope as an audience, when you heard that there were three women of color on the panel, that this was the type of conversation you were gonna get, was how do we talk about mental health from the view of BIPOC communities and how most research that you will quote will not include any of us in them. If you talk any research about ADHD, I'm not in them. <laughs> the only research you're gonna find is how I'm not getting diagnosed properly, how there's no supply and research for me, how we're not even identifying mental health for people of color. Um, and I really like, I mean this to be very, very, very straightforward. I, as an advocate, as an educator, as a poet, my voice is passion. My voice is education, it is a tool. The pain that I have belongs in a table with a therapist I pay a lot of money for. So when I'm on stage, I like to articulate that there are systems, ecosystems that I am a client in as somebody who has a therapist, and these conversations do not happen enough. They don't happen at all. I don't know what other panel you're gonna go to where they're discussing how BIPOC people are misrepresented, not represented at all, not being spoken of, not addressed. So when we get to this point of the conversation, it's important that we hold it. Yeah. Because I know that we could have another panel where I promise you, you might only see one of us on the panel yeah. representing the whole of the BIPOC community. So it is the first and very few times do you see this as a range. So let's sit with it. Let's sit with it. All right, thank you. Oh, wow. And Bandana, can you answer the question around colorism, as I understand this? Colorism. Yes, to your question, which I find quite fascinating because we're all women of color mm -hmm. and it's always about 
you know, white, non-white, but living in India, working at Vogue, it is fascinating how many shades of brown that you can have mm -hmm. and how many shades of brown has a hierarchy of its own. You know, I'm, um, I grew up in India, but I'm Nepali. I'm from the Himalayas. And sure, I, you know, Nepali too, we've got many shades of browns of Nepali. But if you say you're from Nepal or you're from the mountains north of India, then um, you are, you're segregated because, you know, you're more Chinese, you're more Asian, and you're not truly Indian. And so there was always this thing that we had to navigate because I was not the true brown Indian. What was fascinating for me is that, you know, India is, like, if you go right down, if you've traveled all the way down to Kerala, it is closer to the African continent. So the skin tones are much darker, perhaps like yours, gorgeous. If you go right up towards Nepal, Bhutan, then it becomes variation. And to the east, to the west, or what have you. And this is truly working in vogue for 13 years and deciding how are we going to represent a country like India? Who do we put on the covers mm -hmm. to show what kind of uh, female acceptance of color you know, is, can, can be propagated via a fashion magazine. You could never be too dark and you could never be too pale. You had to have the right color of brown. And so just in the way we talk about gender and, 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 and wellness, patriarchy and wellness, what I learned from working in fashion magazines and the, is that we always look at patriarchy we look at racism in, in a certain paradigm. Patriarchy always comes from the men. I have seen more patriarchal women in my life than I've seen men. The patriarchy that was perpetuated by women, no doubt, ignited by, uh, by men. But in certain circumstances where there's hierarchical world is very important, your society, your social strata, whatever it is, patriarchy was horrible in the minds of women. And in the same way, with, with color, with gender, and we are a bunch of women running the fashion magazines of the world telling every other woman, your brown is not right, mm -hmm. or you're not black enough. So you can't have the swag of a black woman because you're not really black. Mm -hmm. But you are, uh, oh, I mean, so within our own community, there is that to navigate, leave alone what we have to face <laughs> once we step out. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna as, as an African woman who is, um, I always laugh about this because in, in my communities, I'm brown skin and I know if I was to go to America, I'd be dark skin. And right, like the shift of my color and how that affects. And then to like kind of circle it back, I had a conversation with my friend who's actually a psychologist. And I was like, when you talk about identity to young kids and you do all the, because he does workshops, and we talk about identity being a major thing that we, we, we should we corely speak about, like who are you, what makes up the composition of who you are, and how often color shows up for black people, right? And the correlation between uh, trying to create a steady sense of identity, and then the world already placing you, because race is a construct, right? And then within, when you are then sitting in front of a clinician talking about who you are, and how often that identity comes and shows up. Right? And how that conversation of struggling to, okay, this is how I feel. Blackness to me is culture, tradition, language, right? That identity and that collapse of identity is so vastly different to the conversation you have when you're around other people, right? Because like I have an accent, I have an Afro. I'm the cool type of black person that people want to hang out with, right? So when I sit down with my therapist to talk about identity and how my placement in the world is, I'm like the spokesperson for every black person everywhere. Like, you have any black related question, you come to me and I'm like, hey, yo, I don't know if I can speak for every black person, right? And then there becomes this unpacking of colorism. And again, like, which brings back that to that statement. We can't even get to colorism because I know there are some people that don't even know what that word means. It's like f so far out of the scope of understanding. So when we look at this infrastructure of wellness, right, which is like, Coley, take care of yourself, maintain your being. Like we've all seen the ads, like go and go to a spa and like go get your nails done or write affirmations. And I wrote a workshop <laughs> talking about like the ideas of self, which are to me self-maintenance, self-celebration, self-actualization, self-care, right, and self-preservation. 
right? Mm -hmm. And those are clearly the things that you have conversations with your therapist about, right? How do I maintain me but not get stuck in survival? How do I elude myself with, that, with still maintaining a place in society that already has a box for me, right? My biggest thing with the wellness industry is we keep making loving yourself to be this weird task of how to get approval mm -hmm. subconsciously. Like everything centered around the conversation of health right now is like, how do you look like a functional adult who has it together? <laughs> step one, make sure you're like, oh, that's the steps, right? It's not like take a breath, like forget the spa, right? Like just wake up, get some sun for 30 minutes, write on a journal, right. play your favorite song and dance, right? The infrastructure in which we're building wellness on, it's just not real. Like, like for people who don't have money, for people who don't have time, this system of how to maintain you and take care of yourself is a delusion. Mm. It does not work. I don't have 30, 40 bucks every time I'm sad to go get a massage. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just not real. So what we, t what we investigate this, my urgency to people all the time, as somebody who runs these workshops, is like figure out how to build a relationship with yourself mm. and master that. Mm -hmm. Get to know you. Right? And then if you have the privilege and accessibility to find somebody who can help you unpack that relationship and the things that you will learn about yourself, utilize the expertise and allow them to guide and navigate around that ecosystem. Right? So just to bring it full circle, it's, it's super important that these delusion of like, do this and do that. Like I was sad once and the girl was like, oh, like, what have you done for yourself recently? I was like, I showered, I ate, and I did my hair. I'm still sad though. <laughs> like those things don't make my sadness go away. But um, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah, I wanted to get that out there. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Can I add something? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. I love that. I think, I think a lot about this quote from John O'Donohue, who is a Celtic priest and poet, and he did this incredible interview with Krista Tippett on, on being. And he talked about how uh, once he was talking to a friend of his who was really suffering, and she wasn't, you know, I think mentally doing well, I think she just went through a divorce or something horrific, and he said in his beautiful Celtic accent um, that she went by the sea for 10 days and she came back completely cured. And it was this act of um, being in nature and the realities of urbanization and the realities of capitalism and the, and the ways in which you know, we're encouraged to you know, buy a thing, buy, put on a face mask. Everything is about what can you do that's outside of you to help you. And it's not that integral question of selfhood which is how can I be well with myself? You know, like you, you, you were explaining the Vedantas and, and the Vedas and, and the Vedanta and the Vedas. And, and I, when I was researching who's wellness for, something that was so compelling to me is that these men, Indian men in caves like 15,000 years ago were thinking about how do I understand the concept and the, um, the connection between the mind and the body. And, that's how yoga came to be. It was, it, was a, it was an understanding that it wasn't just your mind that was in control. Actually, to be the superhuman, to be the Brahmin, to be the, to be the full, you know, entire aspect of yourself to be evolved meant that you had to have a correlation between the mind and the body. That you can't actually just be in your mind. And uh, I think something that capitalism does is it makes yeah. you think that it's it's everything outside of you and not internal mm -hmm. it's not that question of the gut it's not your body saying hey what's going on here it's not the ancestral trauma that lives within your bones that lives within the chronic illness that exists in your body right. like to me what's so exciting about what huda said too is just like yeah it starts here it's it's really about how can you face yourself yeah and uh, start to stitch from that place. Yeah, thank you, for I think in fact, just sorry, one minute, sorry, sorry one we're at time. Okay, then, then, then I will <laughs> say two more. <laughs> sorry about that, we are coming up to time, but it, go, it really goes to your comment, um, and that is the ultimate question of what is wellness, and that's what you were saying, and that's what you both have, and I'm so glad that we've managed to land this very complex conversation 
coming back to the root question of what is wellness and how do we feel and access wellness. So when I first started this conversation, the question I asked was, how many people understand what the term decolonized wellness means? And there was a one whoop over there. Um, by show of whoops, how do you feel about that question now? Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Like that. Mission okay. accomplished. All right, yeah. <laughs> so um, thank you, everybody. And um, I look forward to getting to know you and, and speaking to you. Highly recommend getting Fariha's book. If you're interested in this topic, it's a really deep dive. And there is a lot of literature around decolonization that you can read. Um, thank you to the panelists. A round of applause, please.